business. AI. The report says take-up of the technology across England and Wales is incredibly high, with around half of lawyers surveyed reporting they are already using AI technology. People just don't realise there's an entire new world emerging full of clever new tech that's going to revolutionise the way we do business. The role of the lawyer in particular is changing dramatically. In total, 126 tech startups have raised venture capital funding in Ukraine since the start of last year, according to Pitch Book. I think lawyers, old school lawyers particularly, think that everything that they do is really, really special and so therefore needs to be bespoke and needs to be done manually in a very artisanal way. Great legal tech won't replace a great lawyer, but great legal tech in the hands of a great lawyer is going changing this is legal disruptors powered by semis digital contracting done differently hello and welcome back to the semis legal disruptors podcast i'm tom dunlop the co-founder and ceo of semis and today i'm delighted to be joined by phil simon one of the world's leading independent experts on workplace collaboration and technology so phil's a keynote speaker award-winning author of 14 books and most recently the nine which is the tectonic forces reshaping the workplace and today we're talking about all things collaboration it's a subject very close to my heart and uh, and surmise and uh, certainly how businesses can ensure their teams are collaborating successfully and why that's so important so welcome to the podcast phil Tom, thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to our chat. No problem. So first, I guess, just to, to set the scene, tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, how you got to where you are today. Over the last, oh gosh, uh, 25 years, I've spent most of my career around enterprise technology. Even when I was a college professor, I forced my students to use Slack. Uh, my colleagues wouldn't use it as much, and that was also frustrating because I taught in the information systems department. And this wasn't poetry or you know English literature. This was tech. <laughs> so um, I, I joke that I write a lot of my books out of frustration, or at least my desire not to see a therapist. <laughs> it's a nice. It's a good outlet. It's a creative outlet. I like it. It's narcissist. Good, oh, nice, nice. Um, well, I guess. Jumping into, I mean, certainly a, a book that I've looked at, which is the Reimagining Collaboration, something which will be the, the, the predominant topic for today. Um, what that really highlights is the, I guess, the rise of collaboration tools with Teams and Slack, as you just mentioned, certainly following the uh, COVID pandemic. So I guess just give us a bit more color around where that came from, whether that was a frustration that led to, um, to kind of writing that book. And certainly, I guess, what you noticed around the pandemic era around this kind of prominence of these collaboration tools. Yeah, the, the tools have been popular for a long time. I'm old enough to remember um, internet relay chat back in the in the late 80s, um, kind of preceded Skype and the, the basic kind of building blocks around the contemporary collaboration tools. But you know, we were using them before lockdown, but like e-commerce and um, a bunch of other trends, online learning, um, the pandemic accelerated it. And I'm a data guy. So when I was working on Slack for dummies in late 20. 19, I want to say that Slack had about 10 million primarily business users. And when we started to work from home um, and this Zoom numbers went from, oh gosh, 10 million uh, to about 200 million in March of 2020 and then 300 million in April of 2020, it just became obvious that these tools were going to explode. In fact, Microsoft, which had tried to buy Slack, back in 2016 or 2017 eventually just said we'll build our own tool even though they had built as we were talking before the pod collaborative tools like sharepoint uh, even buying yammer for i think it was 1.2 billion dollars back in i think it was 2012. so now microsoft teams last time i checked is it's over 300 million users but tom as i was writing slack and zoom for dummies it became obvious to me that the tools had so much more power to them. So Slack is not just email 2.0. Zoom is not Skype 2.0. Um, there's so much you can do with these tools, particularly around integrations. And that's when in career about reimagining collaboration, it dawned upon me that we were thinking about collaboration all wrong as a bunch of these disparate tools that weren't connected. And Slack, Zoom, Google Workspace, Microsoft Teams, all of these what I call collaboration hubs make it very easy to connect what I call spokes. So you're still going to use a project management tool, whether it's Asana or Monday or um, there are a million others. You're still going to use um, 
um, content creation tools, whether that's Canva, uh, whether that's Microsoft Word or Google Docs or something. So um, stitching them together to form one single gestalt um, to me offered so many benefits and, and we can get into them, but that's the book at a sort of 30,000 foot level. No, that makes sense. And I think you, you touched on an interesting point there, which is probably what a lot of people don't necessarily think of with these tools, which is that you know, I hear it a lot, particularly from the legal side of things, where I think the perception might be, um, you know, email is better because it's easy. It's, it's a lot more of a traceable. You can search and they, they, they I guess, see Teams and Slack as being a replacement for, for, for email. In terms of the the kind of spokes and the collaboration, and I guess you know we talk about the legal front door in the legal world, which is I guess the the, the interception between the the um, business and and the legal team, and that being kind of um, you know how they interface with legal. It, in terms of this hub, what what do you think is the potential there? Do you think that um, you know the, the that everyone will be using these kind of Teams and Slack and Zoom tools? Um, and that will be the the kind of the start of the, the computer in the morning, and they'll go into these hubs, and then from there, the, they'll access the different spokes that they need. But they will always come to these central places. So it's a lot more than email. That's the goal. Um, I suspect, though, that there's still plenty of folks resisting uh, using Teams, using Slack. Never mind the integrations. Um, and forget what I think. Asacha Nadella, of the CEO of Microsoft, when he was talking about Teams a couple of years ago, I think it's when they announced uh, Project Viva. And now, of course, their focus on, is on AI uh, with um, ChatGPT and other generative AI tools. But Nadella saw Teams as basically the operating system for work. So rather than Windows or Mac OS or Linux open source alternative, you know, basically, that would be the layer on which you spend most of your time. It doesn't mean that you don't need a CRM or an ERP system or different product lifecycle management tools. You do, but fortunately, you can connect hubs to spokes very easily. Uh, many times, there's a native app or integration. Um, so Asana is a perfect example. You can install the Asana app for Slack, for Microsoft Teams, ditto for tools like Notion and Coda, last time I checked. Um, but if there isn't a native integration, then you can use third-party tools, um, some of which I discuss in my book, Low Code, No Code. So Zapier, Make, formerly Integro, or I forget the name of it, was now it's Make, um, even Microsoft with Power Automate. So there are ways to stitch them together without really knowing how to code. And if there really is a legacy system or something particularly bespoke or custom, uh, you can always have your developers or hire developers to build a third-party integration using the vendor's application programming interface or API. So I guess picking up on the point around, you know, certainly if that's going to be the the central place where people access the workplace um, and essentially have these spokes that go off to different applications. If you're, I guess uh, it's probably a, a, the same question, but if you're sat on the, the the kind of customer side and you're looking for potential solutions to a particular problem that you have, so you're looking for one of these applications, how important is it that though, those applications, I guess, have an existing integration into those tools? And do you think that should be, I guess, a, a key criteria for evaluating potential vendors if you're you know, on the company side? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, t to me, if there's truly something out there that meets this very distinct business need and it doesn't integrate, you might just basically have to deal with it. But if you give me the choice between two tools that perform the same purpose, let's say it's for document creation. So I'm a big fan of, have you heard of Notion? Yes, yeah. yeah. Big fan. Um, and I love the integration with, with Slack and I'm sure it integrates with my Microsoft Teams even though I'm more of a Slack guy. Uh, now there are other tools. Let's say that you've, built an internal one that's got years and years of knowledge and just moving over to a new tool would be too cumbersome or expensive. Um, okay, I could understand the point for doing that, but if you were certainly adopting a new tool and Notion integrated natively with Slack, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, whatever, and Tool X did not, yeah, for me, that would be a deal breaker um, because it's not just a matter of convenience. I would argue that it's a matter of the way the organization views itself. Do you want to be this standalone entity that exists in this independent silo, or do you make it easy to play with other tools? And I think Zapier is a great example of that. Zapier is basically saying, we will help you stitch together thousands of different apps in all sorts of creative ways, because there just is a lack of programmers. Um, 
very much so. I, I don't know about the UK, but certainly in the US, it's a it's a big issue. And AI will alleviate some of that, but there are all sorts of issues around that we can get into. So yeah, if I were starting a software company, I'd think long and hard about trying to be an island um, because the need to integrate with these other tools is essential. There was an Okta study that I saw a couple of years ago researching, I think it was the project management book, and they found that their average customer used about 88 different apps and web services. And in the case of large organizations, it was double that. So wow. imagine having to you know, maintain different usernames and passwords. But apart from that, if three different parts of the organization use three different storage tools or communication and collaboration tools, that's three different licenses. That's all sorts of issues around um, renewing agreements and costs and just finding basic documents as something that we continue to struggle doing. So I would rather pick one single powerful integrated contemporary tool um, even if that meant moving off of a legacy one that had no plans to play with these other tools. Um, I'm a big believer that we should stitch them all together and make the context switching and the multitasking, I put that in quotes, um, much more manageable for people because by the end of the day, and there's plenty of neurologi neuro neurological research behind this, we're just fried. Even though we're working from home, you know, we're bouncing back and forth. I mean, I read some statistic that we switch apps, you know, sometimes 200 times a day. That's just wow. not, your brain just wasn't meant for that. So if we can keep a lot of our information in one place, yeah, we're still going to use different apps. You're not going to be able to, to do everything in Microsoft Word or Google Docs or Excel or whatever inside of Slack or Microsoft Teams. But if I could switch five times an hour as opposed to 25 times an hour, I do think that I'll be more productive and less burned out. Yeah, it's a great point. And I think that you, you've hit on one of the things, which is software is meant to be, I guess, make people more efficient. And I think the, the sheer number of applications and how they're all been set up essentially as islands is having the complete opposite effect of efficiency. It's actually causing a, a, a huge lag on efficiency because of the number of tools in uh, the, the majority of cases. Well, um, apart from and just code, uh, you to think about just duplicate documents, right, or finding certain things. I mean, there's so many benefits to sticking with one tool. Uh, it could become challenging when you're dealing with third parties because they might not have a license for it, but Slack and Microsoft Teams offer the ability, whether it's through Slack Connect or inviting guests to basically share channels or team spaces or workspaces. So there really isn't a good reason to pretend like it's 1995. Uh, the world on so many levels isn't going back. Well, I guess on that point, because one of the favorite bits of the book that you talk about, which is very relevant for, I guess, you know, ourselves as a software vendor dealing with change and people in an organization that may be resistant to change. I love the uh, the names of Holdout Henry and Emily, the email addicts, which are two of the personas that you mentioned in your book. And I guess it talks to me a little bit about some of these personas and, and I guess ways that you can uh, I guess convince these uh, these people to, to to move to this new I say new world you know this guy's been around for a while but the, the this way of working yeah the uh, personas are all fictionalized versions of people I met in real life I changed the name so I wouldn't get sued but yeah there are lots of <laughs> folks who resist using new tools in general and when it comes to communication and collaboration a lot of us over the years have developed very email centric systems. And uh, with, I think it was Emily, the email addict, um, who was a, a woman who wor worked with me when I was a college professor. And we'd have to update our syllabi. And we're talking about thousands of professors, each teaching multiple courses. And she would just email people updates, most, sometimes uh, two or three times a week. And the better approach would have been to have every professor point to the same text on the university website, and then you can make whatever changes you want. But by forcing professors to make these changes, even if it took three to five minutes per change, right, you're talking about thousands of professors, and that isn't very collaborative. It's a very old school way of thinking. In terms of getting people to change, therein lies the challenge. Um, it, it, I've for a long time, Tom, had this very simplistic three-pronged view of the world. There are folks that get it. Clearly, you're in that boat. You and I would get along swimmingly. Um, there are folks who don't get it but want to get it. And I love those folks because they're open to new ways of doing things. When I lived in Las Vegas, I 
bought a home for the first time with some land and I didn't know anything about landscaping. So I found a landscaper, 55 year old guy, very nice guy, uh, knows a lot about landscaping, but his website had been built in 1997 and looked like it. And this was back in 2011. So I said, Jeff, why don't you knock a couple thousand dollars off the price of the landscape and I will build you a responsive, contemporary, cool website. So we did. And then I remember he came over one day to check the trees or something, but he brought a WordPress book. And he said, I had some questions about embedding a YouTube video in the sidebar. I love that, right? To me, you're never <laughs> too old to learn. So those folks are, are great because they're basically saying, show me a better way um, and I'll, I'll listen. The folks that I want to avoid, the third group, are those that don't get it and won't get it. So in terms of change management, if you've identified those folks in your team, um, it's probably time to have a serious conversation with them. I'm not talking about someone who forgets to tag someone in a Slack channel. I'm not talking about someone who posts something in the wrong channel because we all make mistakes. I'm talking about employees who are willingly defiant. Uh, also, when I lived in Vegas, I spoke with a startup owner and he said he had to fire a, a new hire because she just would not get off of email. And he explained to her consistently, we all use Slack. This is where work happens to quote one of Slack's um, uh, credos. <laughs> so either basically get on board or get out and if you had to get out. So um, ideally you're finding folks. And even when you interview, as I write in the project management book, you know, someone could say, oh, I'm very collaborative. What else are you going to say when asked the question? But give them a project, do the interview over a tool uh, like Teams or Slack or correspond with that person. If that person doesn't use the new tools during the recruiting progress uh, process when they're ostensibly putting their best foot forward, well, what does that mean when they get the job in two months and they say, yeah, I don't do that. And I do think that it, I mean, the, the title Reimagining Collaboration is a pretty apropos um, because we're collaborating with folks. We're not working independently. Um, this notion that I'm going to use whatever tools I want, I think bring your own device, BYOD, sort of ushered in that error. But there are all sorts of benefits to using the same tools and all sorts of costs, things like security and creating alternate versions of the truth, um, cost as well of using these different tools. So. Um, it's not the longest book, but um, I think the concepts in it still apply today because we're still struggling with change management, particularly as we try to figure out hybrid work. Yeah, 100%. And I think this plays into the next uh, question a little bit as well, which is, um, I guess you could look at Teams and Slack in isolation today and how they function and how that can improve collaboration. But, you know, so with the advent of things like Copilot, with Microsoft Loop, for example, which is a, you know, a huge, I guess, forward-thinking initiative to do with collaboration across these platforms is there what, what do you think the future looks like so i guess if you know trying to get these people on board to i guess the status quo what people understand today but paint that picture for you know if you don't get on board today in five years time you know this is what it'll look like what, what what's your view as to to what, what that'll look like i like the um reference to a salesperson in 2028 in the in the book as well about this about like a day in the life almost of yeah yeah what will I, it be like yeah, you know, I've been around technology for a long time. I got my first computer when I was 12 uh, a long time ago. So the, the tools will get smarter. Um, we can unpack that if you want, but whether it's OpenAI or Slack GPT or Claude from Anthropic, I mean, these bots already exist. And I feel pretty good about in chapter 15 of, the, of Reimagining Collaboration, kind of putting on my Swami hat and saying, how does this all play out? And, and I do think that the more that people use these tools, remember Slack is a pretty generic backronym for searchable log of all communications and knowledge. People don't realize that um, nice. it becomes smarter when you put more into it. So as a perfect example, if you and I work together for 10 years and I'm typing a DM to you in Slack, then maybe I'm going on too long and go, you know what? You may want to stop right here because Tom doesn't read messages this long or a video would be better. That's why something like Slack clips makes sense. In fact, I don't know if you saw this, but a couple of days ago, Zoom dropped basically the same product, Zoom clips. <laughs> so all these tools are converging. If one vendor, Microsoft Zoom puts out a killer feature, other vendors will integrate it. That's pretty standard and that's you know, been around for decades as basically a, a me too um, or copycat philosophy. Uh, they'll also get more integrated, so additional integrations. You know, Slack's got Workflow Builder, but they kind of blew up their platform about a year ago to make it even easier for non-developers to create their own bespoke apps or mini apps inside. 
and I think they'll get more um, integrated. Um, so, you know, maybe there's a future in which you don't need a, a tool like Zapier quite as much because these third party apps integrate more natively, uh, but they certainly won't stand still. And I'm excited to see what they'll come out with. Uh, when I was writing the nine, I discovered how augmented and virtual reality or mixed reality are making training even better. And the notion that we're doing this on Microsoft Teams, that this is the best we can do is of course absurd. Um, I'm sure there will be ways in the future around you know, whether it's mixed reality or augmented or um, virtual reality to make these immersive experiences even more real because as I'm sure you'd agree, hybrid work is, is here to stay. Yeah, no, definitely. And I, I, I really like the, um, the point that you could almost predict or you could you could almost educate people at the best way of communicating with other people either in the business or externally due to that conversation history and that learning that's gone on i think that's a really powerful um concept that it not only becomes a a, a, a i guess a facilitator to a collaboration but it actually becomes a, almost an advisor on how to collaborate based on previous behavior or something that can identify distant um, early warning. So let's say that you and I used to communicate a lot and then I'm not as active on channels or I don't vote in polls. Um, maybe that's a sign that I'm starting to disengage and I'm not happy with something. And there are analytics in Slack. Of course, they're going to get better over time. Uh, even with Microsoft, with Teams and Viva, the, the whole point was to basically help you run your workplace because we're overworked. We can't observe every trend. No AI isn't perfect, but maybe it could provide nudges to employees or nudges to managers or HR folks that, hey, we have a potential problem here. Uh, there's a, perhaps a toxic discussion going on in one of the channels or just um, you know, potentially a breach or something like that. So the possibilities are limitless, in my opinion. Uh, they don't replace the need for talking to people in person uh, on occasion. I'm no expert on large language models. I know a decent amount based over the last year or so. But to me, it's important to keep as much information as possible in the hub. Uh, that way your AI will be that much more intelligent and less generic. Um, that doesn't happen if you're using 26 different tools to collaborate. No, it's totally. And if you were, I mean, this is a, it's a, it's a bit of a potential random question, but if if you were, you know, at the, the, the helm of a business or, um, you know, you mentioned a, a, a person that actually, I guess, fired a person from a business because they wouldn't get on board with, you know, one of these collaboration tools. Um, would you make the bold move to say, you know, because I know companies that do this and like no more email, you know, they, they, we have to put all our information into this tool. Is that, would you think we're at that point where that, that would be a decision you'd make? I'd say no, but I want as much internal communication in there as possible. Um, if you're, let's say, trying to sign up a new client and they say flat out, we have banned Slack or blacklisted Zoom or Teams or whatever. Um, you know, if you want to do business with us, you have to learn a new tool or you have to use email. I'd evaluate that on a case by case basis. If it's a, a $100 project, is it really worth it? Probably not. If it's a $100 million project, you might think about things a bit differently. But um, I try to evaluate clients and vendors based on their facility for using new tools and some of the stories in the book reimagining collaboration stem from my frustrations slack and the other internal collaboration hubs tom as you know don't eliminate the need for email um, and there are good emails and bad emails there's an email from someone who's legitimately interested in purchasing some eyes products and services that that's a good email you probably want to get that into a crm or into notion or slack at some point but if you start off that way that's fine um, that's a lot different as a sort of an initial query than routine discussions and meetings among employees that are always in email because email is ephemeral, right? Your employee leaves, the information in the inbox basically goes away, uh, whereas Slack is a lot more permanent, as you know, ditto for Teams and Zoom. If you leave the company, you're just deactivated, but it, you don't want someone saying, yeah, what did Tom decide about that a year ago? And then when you think about AI, you could be searching for a template for some sort of ROI calculation or a spreadsheet or um, PowerPoint slides. But then if you keep all that in there, again, in the future, what's to stop Claude or some other generative AI tool from going, I think you're looking for this, uh, which of mm -hmm. course is going to save you a bunch of time and rework. So uh, if it were, if I were king of a larger company, um, I would be pretty dictatorial about it because one mistake or two doesn't really kill you. 
but it's death by a thousand cuts. It's basically allowing for exceptions. So Tom's the CEO. He doesn't do Slack. Well, then how come I have to do it? And then the conversation, as I write in the book, gets bifurcated. Some of it's in email, some of it's in Slack, some of it's in Notion or whatever. And that makes it very difficult to efficiently run your business. Interesting. So well, I guess one thing that email um, has traditionally been used for is things like marketing campaigns, sales campaigns. You know, it's, it's part of a lot of people's go-to-market model. Do you foresee that in any way, you know, advertisement sales will come into this kind of hub and the collaboration tools? Or do you think that basically people have to reinvent, um, I guess, the wheel on how they might prospect? Obviously, there's other channels, but just interested to understand what your view is on uh, how that might interplay with these tools. Yeah, I don't I can just tell you that I get annoyed when I go into Zoom or Slack and it tries to upgrade me. I, I don't like <laughs> ads there. I'm there to work. Um, so I, yeah. I can see how if you used, um, let's just say Notion and they were doing a promotion. All right, fine. Um, good to know. But if you overdo that, you you know, I'm in Slack or Microsoft Teams fundamentally to work. Uh, it's not Discord or Reddit where you might just be posting pictures of English Bulldogs or uh, Lyle Messi's uh, most recent goal in, in, in what you guys would call football, what we would call soccer. So I'd yeah. be careful about that. And again, email does not go away, but I'd like to think that eternal, internal email effectively does, or at least is, is significantly reduced. So I would be really careful about bugging people when they're there to do work. In fact, Slack, you probably saw this yesterday, announced a, a forthcoming redesign uh, to help people focus a bit more ads by definition, um, take away your focus. So I, I would be really careful about flooding channels with ads or upgrade notices um, because we do want people to use them to work. And also, and this is one of my pet peeves about notifications on phones or devices, I, I really feel like there should be a consumer's bill of rights around letting you at a granular level say, I wanna receive notifications about these types of things. And Slack even a couple of days ago announced that you're gonna be able now to mute people, not just conversations. So if someone's just constantly needy, God knows I had that experience as a professor for you know three or four years, I've been saying, please give me the ability, I can't kick someone out of the workspace, right? <laughs> that would get me in trouble with the administration, but I, I want there to be friction for you to contact me because some people just, you know, you, you manage people, right? The 90-10 rule, you probably spend, uh, I shouldn't say you specifically, I'm sure you've got a great team, but, you know, typically managers spend a lot of their time on a few people. And also, I'm a big proponent of a three email or three message rule. So if you and I really need to have a discussion, let's do that in real time versus I don't understand, send. Well, you're eight hours away um, here. It's 7.38 in the morning. Uh, what is it there? 3.33 or 3.38 p.m.? So yeah. you don't get it. There's a huge difference in time zones and something that could take five minutes to hash out in real time, as the kids say, or uh, would take days or sometimes even weeks. Um, there's an example in my project management book about a developer who had a very simple question. It took him a week to get an answer. And he needed that answer in order to proceed because he was kind of at a fork in the road. So. Um, yeah, I've got no shortage of opinions about collaboration, and I think they're rooted in, I think, efficiency and research. Um, but you know, not everyone is as um, excited about these tools. But I do think that they can make us work in a much more efficient way and reduce the amount of time we spend, quite frankly, on bullshit scheduling meetings. Calendly, right? I'm, I'm not doing that. Um, mm. you know, there's just there's so many ways to make life better, but resistance to change is a uh, very real. Yeah, no, totally. So I guess the last question, and uh, you've, you've, well, I guess you can add that you can answer this in maybe two different ways. Um, first, uh, what's next for you? And then I'll follow this up with a, a question as well, which you could um, talk about. We've talked about a few other things today, which is kind of what's the next big breakthrough that you see in terms of workplace collaboration? I mean, we, we talked about VR, AR, we've talked about AI assistance getting cleverer and how that can advise on behavior issues, analytics, things like that. So What's next for you? And then do you think there's a, a well, are we on the cusp of a potential new big breakthrough or trend? All right. Um, so I, I definitely have ideas for additional books. I just finished ghost writing a book. So that's taken up some of my time. I, I think that the new book, The Nine, does have legs and 
will lead to speaking gigs, webinars, workshops, um, all sorts of opportunities, certainly consulting. I think we just saw the next big break with generative AI. You know, what goes beyond that? You know, I don't know, five, 10 years quantum computing. Um, but rather than thinking about one big thing coming, uh, I wrote the nine because I saw nine uh, powerful, inexorable trends, whether it's inflation or disbursement, employee empowerment, blockchain, generative AI, fractions. Um, I don't think that there's necessarily one big breakthrough coming uh, beyond what we just saw back in November. Um, but I think that there'll be a bunch of forces that are going to interact in ways that we can't possibly predict. Um, there's an example in the new book, The Nine, about how um, a company startup, I think uh, might have been based out of Boston, tried to fuse generative AI with immersive tech. And through a um, basically a headgear, you'd be able to, to listen to the judge and then respond. So you wouldn't need a lawyer. And the premise was to use this to fight traffic tickets. I think the startup's called Do Not Pay. And I think it was a judge and several districts of a, um, D, um, assistant districts of attorney said, if you basically pull this again, we will put you in jail. Um, so there, I mean, it's, it's, it's right now, it's very chaotic, as you know, and I, I don't know what plays out when for which industry or which company, but I just, I, the premise of the new book is that the workplace is not reverting to pre pandemic times. And I will, I will die on that hill. Yeah, I think that's a fair, a fair prediction. Uh, well, listen, Phil, it's been uh, great to have you on the podcast. Thank you so much for your time and I wish you the best with the launch of the nine as well. It's a, it's a great book, great topics. And certainly if anyone's interested in um, looking at the future of the workplace the collaboration, it's really insightful. and A lot of really interesting topics to uh, to think about. So thank you. Thanks, Tom. I enjoyed it.